Hey, Bowtie Nation, Joseph Hogue here. Thank you for joining us for another one of these weekly market updates coming to you at 9 a.m. Uh, Monday mornings. Get you ready for the market week as well as a, an important topic. And we've got one for you this week. You know, it's it probably sounds a little weird talking about the next bull market when stocks are probably going to find new lows. You know, there is no... Uh, there's no sign that the uh, the market has reached its low yet. Uh, we can talk about that later, why that is, and why stocks are, are continuing to fall. I've shared my expectations about that in the past um, and probably see a bottom closer to really the the end of this year at the earliest, but probably more likely in the first or second quarter of next year. That's really where I think we see the peak in those interest rates. We see the uh, the worst of the recession fears, the worst of the uh, consumer spending drop off that we're going to see after you know home utility bills start hitting uh, consumers' pockets. Uh, that's probably where the worst of the the recession and the high interest rates is going to start being baked into stocks. So. That's kind of what I'm looking at as far as uh, you know a market bottom and the stock market crash we're all living through right now, right? So it's weird to start talking about a bull market, but investors need to understand that right now is the best time to be thinking about those trends, the the trends that are going to lead us into the next bull market, the trends that are going to dominate that next bull market, and. You know, it's while everyone else is panicking, while everyone else is selling. And that's not to say that uh, you should be running out to buy the stock, some of the stocks that we'll talk about today or buy into that trend. Uh, you just need a playbook for how you're going to do that when that does start coming around, right? So last week we did share, uh, I did share my, my strategy for buying stocks at those three different levels, all three of which are still lower than, than the market is today. So I'm still waiting for uh, the market to drop a little bit more to start buying in using some of my cash. But you do want to be aware of what this next trend is, where it's going to come from, and, and how you're going to invest in that ahead of time. So I wanted to talk about that today. Also, of course, we're going to uh, hit some Q&A. Love doing uh, the Q&A and, and reaching out to you in the community. I already see a lot of a lot of you uh, out there in the Bowtie Nation, out there in the chat. Ambrose, good to see you there from New York. Uh, Rod, hey, good to see you there. Thank you for joining us. I do want to, uh, before we get started, I, I do want to point out we've got a special opportunity here. If you haven't checked out Seeking Alpha Premium yet, now I used to write for Seeking Alpha, one of my first analyst jobs actually, uh, back in 2011, 2012, worked, uh, started writing on the site. You know, I've used the site since then. The regular, the free articles kind of hit or miss on the analysis on there so, sometimes. Let me uh, let me be honest with you there. Uh, but when you get into the premium articles, you do get that premium analysis, the articles that really the editors hold back for the premium subscribers. So actually to talked to somebody, uh, one of my old coworkers there at Seeking Alpha, got a special deal for everyone there. I'm going to put the link in the chat or in the description below. Uh, you get $140 off. That's 60%. Usually, uh, usually it's about 120, 135 dollars for uh, you know all the after all the discounts for premium. But right here, you get it for 99 dollars a year. That's less. That's about eight dollars a month. And uh, just try it out. You know, actually, there's a free trial. There's like a two week free trial. You can click through that link, start your free trial, and just see if you like it there. But I'll be using a lot of the uh, the data and the analysis that that I've gotten from the uh, the premium articles there in the uh, in the newsletter today. So just check that out. That's a uh, that's the link there in the description below, or in the description, or in the the chat there. But I want to get started here because this is an important topic. Like I said, you want to be ready for these uh, for these trends for the next bull market. And you know, a lot of investors think that success picking or success investing uh, or investing is about constantly being right. You know, uh, always being able to pick that next best stock. Uh, you know, find, constantly finding those stocks that are going to uh, double and triple your money. But honestly, really, and this is from more than 10 years as an equity an analyst, uh, working in private wealth management as well as venture capital, success in investing over decades is really about being wrong less, losing money as little money as possible, losing less on those bad investments uh, when the market crashes, and just being right with a couple of big trends. You know, in, a, uh, in an industry, uh, you've all, all heard that most portfolio managers, most fund managers don't beat their index, right? They fail to, to beat just that index that they're competing against. 
And in that industry where just one or 2% performance, outperformance, separates those star portfolio managers from really the guys that got shit canned, right, that lose their jobs, just getting the index return 90% of the time and then making a few great calls, a few big trend calls, is going to make you like Peter Lynch, okay? Um, for individual investors out there, you know, that extra 2% return even uh, is going to be huge for your portfolio, okay? If you invest just $500 a month, right, so 6000 a year, $500 a month over 30 years at 11% will grow to $1.3 million. Okay. If you only get the market return of about 9% though, so you underperform by 2% two, uh, 2 there, uh, it's going to set you back $400,000. You'll, you'll have, you still have $900,000 after 30 years, which isn't bad, but uh, just an extra 2% annualized return uh, is going gonna, is gonna to make you $400,000 more. And that's what we're really talking about here is finding that next big trend, getting on that early and, and understanding where that is. And, and I think I found it with this. You know, we've talked about uh, the copper, the coming copper shortage before, mostly in our EV stock uh, videos. But I wanted to, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to revisit that because that is where one of the next bull markets is going to be. You know, I can't say it's it's going to be the the biggest bull market or the biggest trend that we're going to see over the next ten years, but it is definitely going to be one of them. Um, you know, while the price of copper has uh, crashed since about a third since March, and we'll look at where to find those copper prices and how to look at that, uh, there were just a few years out from a massive uh, supply deficit, right, a supply shortage, uh, and there's really nothing, nothing anybody can do about it. Okay, most people don't understand copper is used in pretty much anything. Anything that uses electric or has a, an electric charge that goes through it, that has copper. It's, it's going to have copper because copper is one of the best conductors out there. So it's going to be, uh, you know, your cars, your toasters, uh, computer chips, a lot of the electrification that we're doing uh, as far as the smart grid, as well as, uh, you know, clean energy, things like that. So copper is, copper demand is going to surge and we're going to look at some, some estimates for that. But like most commodities, you know, uh, production just has not kept up with it. Okay, uh, when you look at oil production, so drilling, when you look at uh, copper mining, when you look at some of these other base metals, and we usually look at things like lithium and cobalt, uh, those other base metals or, or minerals that are going into electric batteries as that big shortage, but really, you know, it's really in copper because copper is used in so much more than just those electric vehicle batteries, right? It is used in so much more, so many more uh, uh, products. So the shortage is going to be uh, much more there. And, and when you look at those, the mining just has not kept up. Okay, The prices have been lower uh, over the past couple of years for a lot of these commodities. And why dig it out of the ground if you're not going to make any money out of it? right? So you've got uh, companies like Newport, uh, Newmont Corporation, which is one of the largest, uh, world's largest miners, just scrapped plans for its $2 billion gold and copper project in Peru. Okay. Um, Freeport McMoran, uh, the world's largest publicly traded copper uh, copper miner, has warned that the current price is too far below cost to uh, to support new production. Okay, so you've got all these producers, all these miners, saying that uh, you know we're scaling back or have scaled back over the last several years on their copper production, on their mining. And the problem is here that you don't just dig the stuff out of the ground in an instant. Okay, it can take up to ten years to develop a new copper project and get it get it producing. So that slowdown, you know, even over the last decade, is really going to hit production and supply of copper just when we need it most. Okay, I'll share share a few of these uh, charts I've got for you here. The so this is one we've shared uh, a couple times, the average cop copper content in different types of vehicles. Okay, the average copper content, so the amount of copper in a traditional combustion engine vehicle is about 50 pounds, uh, 50 pounds of copper. But here you look at hybrid electric vehicles, 85 pounds, battery electric vehicles, okay. So the, uh, the, the electric vehicles that we're all getting to here in the next uh, five to 10 years at, at the most, 183 pounds of copper, okay? More than three times, almost four times the amount of copper that you need in a traditional combustion engine car. So uh, just demand exploding from that. We've got uh, we've got some supply and demand stuff here. You know, as the world goes uh, electric, so those emission goals alone could double the demand for copper to 50 million metric tons by 2035. Okay, uh, analysts by by Bloomberg forecast demand over the next 18 years uh, and found 28% increase in demand by 2030. Okay, that's just seven years. 30% demand by 2030 and 50% by 2040. And that's that was in the worst case scenarios, right? The the 
worst case scenario where we do get a recession next year and that really draws back on copper demand and uh, and copper prices but this is the uh, this is the chart that they showed on that analysis so we see here 22030 and we see the the lithium and cobalt here as well but but I want you to look at the copper one on the left copper chart this uh, the darker blue uh, the darker blue here is the operating production uh, the lighter blue is that plus the planned production right copper copper mines under construction and you can see that even even with the planned the planned copper production right the, the planned mining uh, it's still it's still in reverse right it's still declining uh, as far as total total copper production global production and then, of course, the the red and the yellow lines are a different supply estimate or a different demand estimate. So, how much copper we're going to need. And what's interesting here is that all of all the trends that we look at, you know, those longer term trends, the big universal forces like demographics, like an aging population, like uh, you know, AI and and things like that. You know, cryptocurrencies, uh, digital digitalization, all those long term big trends that we look at that you want to get in front of. Uh, they're all five, ten years out, right? They are all very much longer trends uh, to watch for and, and slower developing. If you look at this copper, though, I mean, we are in a supply deficit by 2024, 2025. We start running out of copper um, according to our demands. You know, even if even if we get all of this uh, under construction production to hit, which a lot of that has been scaled back because the prices have fallen and, and are lower uh, over the last ten years, but even if we get all of that planned production to hit here in the next couple of years, we're still just at best break even for supply and demand. And then it just gets worse right from there. Okay, a deficit, so put this into perspective for you, a deficit of uh, just 441,000 tons last year was enough to drive the price of copper up 25% to about 475 a pound, right? Just a deficit of just 400,000 tons. Now, uh, S and P, uh, you know, S and P research uh, forecasts that the deficit by 2035, so the deficit on the production and supply that we just looked at that graph, could reach 10 million tons by 2035. Okay, that could be as much as the third the copper that we need. It just isn't available, and, and there's really nothing you can do about it. Okay. You know, like I said, you can't you can't just dig this stuff out of the ground immediately. You got to get the permitting. You got to find it. You got to do the resource, uh, you know, the resource estimates and, and things like that. And it takes about ten years to get a mine up to uh, production and, and really to, to peak production. So this is like a slow moving train wreck that nobody can nobody can get off the tracks, right? Uh, we're going to need that copper for electrification, for electric vehicles, for pretty much everything electric, and it's just not going to be there. So what do you think that's going to do to prices? If a 400,000 ton deficit uh, drove the price up 25%, what do you think a deficit of 22 times that, 10 million tons uh, by, by 2035 is going to do to the price? Uh, Goldman Sachs actually estimates that the uh, forecast the price of copper to double to seven dollars and fifty cents a pound by 2025. And, and folks, again, that is just like two years away. Okay, uh, again, a lot of these longer term trends that I really love, that I think you should be behind uh, and investing in, those are five, ten year trends that that are slowly developing and slowly increasing the prices for those products and for, the, for those companies. This trend is is going to hit within the next year, within the next two years. Uh, Goldman Sachs saying the price could double. By, by 2025. Now, one thing you got to understand here is that a recession is going to is going to lower the short term, and that's what I want to talk about when we talk about you know how to invest here. Okay, because just like just like uh, you know watching for that market bottom and the strategy that I shared last week. You're not necessarily jumping in right now. Uh, I do think you know even if you were to do some of those things that we'll talk about here, uh, you're still going to make very good money. But I do think uh, the price of copper will come down over the next few months, just on those recession fears, and, and as we do head into a recession and an economic slowdown. Okay, because again, of course, uh, you know copper is used in in everything in infrastructure, electric electric uh, vehicles electric products, anything electric, right? Uh, as well as infrastructure, building construction, things like that. So, you know, as we do get into a recession and the econo economy slows down, you're going to have less demand for copper and that's going to bring down the prices. But of course, that doesn't change that long-term picture, okay? That does nothing to change the long-term picture of how much copper we're going to need. And, and that's what you want to watch for. Okay, so 
So what I'm looking at is maybe towards the end of the year, right, as the recession, as a recession fears and that reality that we are going to hit a recession, as that gets baked into stocks, as that brings down the price of copper, then you start looking at some of these uh, some of these copper investments that we'll talk about now. What I would do is, yeah, wait till towards the end of the year, start getting a little bit more aggressive, you know, buying every month, you know, buying every month into uh, into next year, uh, and then just really waiting out that uh, that that copper supply deficit uh, story. So, so I want to talk about a few ways to invest. Again, don't stress out about uh, this because the market is going to give you time. It's going to give you at least a few months to uh, to really plan this out and what you're what you're going to be looking at. Now, futures futures investing uh, on the CME is is really going to be where the institutional players uh, and the you know the the private wealth plays this out. It's but it's a very risky and complicated market, so it might not be might not be right for a lot of people out there. If you are interested in futures investing, uh, the CME, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, does the futures there. You just type in, go to Google and type in uh, CME Copper. It'll bring you to this uh, CME group. You go here to uh, Markets. Go down to Copper here, HG, and that'll that'll take you to Copper. And if you go to Quotes, you can look at some of these prices. The the It'll bring up the chart. We'll look at one chart here. This is the December's contract, and you can see how uh, just this year uh, that on that big commodities boom, it did just jump up to 475, 485 a pound for copper. It has since come crashing down to 344, but it's still quite a bit higher than uh, than it has been back in 2020, 2020 or 2019, 2018. And that's really where you saw a lot of that, a lot of that supply destruction. A lot of those miners saying that you know, at uh, something like like here, uh, before the pandemic was 267. A lot of miners saying, you know what, we're going to slow down our production. We're going to slow down our mine exploration uh, because the copper prices are just too low to justify you know where those what those mines are going to cost us. Uh, now, now they're paying the price. Okay, they're paying the price because that because uh, of that copper supply. Uh, picture is going to be so much lower right when we need it over the next couple of years. Now here again, I'm talking about uh, talking. I think this uh, this copper price can get back down to around three dollars a pound or so. You know, it can fall further uh, as we head into a recession. But I think that's where I would be. I would start picking up uh, you know futures or some of these other uh, some of these other investments that we'll talk about. Now to understand futures, understand that you know each. Uh, each contract for a futures contract is for twenty five thousand pounds, right? So, which would be about eighty five thousand dollars worth of copper, you know, for one futures contract right now. But the good thing about futures is that you can get a lot of leverage. You can get a lot of margin. You actually only need about six or seven thousand dollars to buy that eighty five thousand dollars worth of of copper that contract. And those contracts, you do have to understand, you know, how to roll over those contracts. Their contracts, they're a lot like options investing. So uh, definitely, uh, you know, if you if you want a little bit higher risk, higher return investment in copper, then you could check that one out. Uh, for others, you know, I'd I'd look at uh, something like the COPX, which that's not it, but we'll look at we'll look at here. The COPX is the Copper Miners, uh, the Copper Miners Fund, the ETF, Global X. Copper Miners ETF, that's ticker COPX. Uh, you can see it here, rebounding a little bit in the pre-market today, uh, down down Friday with the rest of the market. But what's what's really great about this is not only can you invest in a fund that uh, covers a lot of the miners, and you can say see you know any fund. You go here to Yahoo Finance or to that fund's webpage, and you go to Holdings. and it's going to show you uh, you know what stocks are the the stocks held in that. Okay. I've actually got uh, COPX here. Uh, this is from the the fund's website, uh, so C COPX Global X uh, ETF website, and, and you can go to the top holdings, and you can see you know which which miners are held in that fund. So not as only is it a great way to get an idea of, uh, or to, a great way to invest across the whole fund. You know, get that diversified investment across all the copper miners. And get that dividend yield, uh, but you can also see which copper miners are in there, and maybe if you want to invest in individual miners as well, you can see this uh, this copper miners ETF does pay a 3.7% dividend, right? Which is great, um, you know, 
one of the one of the things I have against commodities investing like gold and and copper and those others is if you're holding the physical metal, right? If you're holding futures contracts or something like that, you're not getting paid until you sell, right? They you get no dividends, you get no no cash flow if you invest in the hard metal itself. Uh, but if you do invest in the copper miners, then you're going to get that dividend of 3.7 percent while you wait for the price to come back up. And you can look at what the uh, what the price has done uh, over the past year. You know, with with when prices went to four four eighty a pound, then this uh, this copper miners fund was up to forty six dollars uh, earlier this year. Hit a hit a peak of forty seven dollars, um, and that was at four eighty a pound. You know, Goldman Sachs estimating that the price could hit seven dollars and fifty cents a pound by twenty twenty five. So imagine, you know, this is this copper fund could be uh, as high as you know, as high as uh, 60, $70 each, uh, you know, if that, if that happens, the problem I have with copper, with the miners and the, uh, the copper fund there. And again, you know, if you, if you're investing in the individual miners, I do like Freeport McMoran, that's ticker FCX. I like Southern Copper, that's ticker SCCO. Uh, they're both leaders in copper production. They both have geographic diversification uh, across, uh, you know, across their, their mining production. And so two things really worry me about the miners and about investing in those in that mining ETF as well as the individual miners. One is that as we do get that severe uh, supply deficit, right? As we do hit, uh, you know, just so much demand and very little supply on the market. What worries me is that we should could see some kind of resource nationalization, especially from the emerging markets. Okay, a lot of copper production. Most of the copper production is done in, in emerging markets like Peru, like Chile, um, and I think there's a very good, a very real possibility that they could start, you know, not necessarily maybe even to the point of nationalizing their copper reserves or their copper deposits, but uh, charging excess fees on the uh, on the mining there. So. You know any of those miners that have uh, production in those countries or in any of the other countries uh, that, that might do this, they could get hit on those that nationalization or those excess fees. Uh, just as we get, you know, like I said, that could be a, a, as much as a third of the demand uh, could just be missing from uh, from the supply picture here over the next few years. Uh, that's one thing that worries me about the miners. The other thing is if you're investing in the miners. And there's just not enough projects out there, then uh, they might not fully benefit from that price uh, from that price increase in copper, right? Uh, you know, they can't get it, they can't get that seven dollars and fifty cents a pound per copper if they if they don't have the copper to dig it out of the ground, right? Like I said, a lot of those miners have kind of scaled back on their production and on their projects over the last decade uh, just because the price was so low. So you know, if they have to ramp up production, that's going to mean e extra spending, capital uh, capital expenditures to to get those mines up and uh, ready. For faster. That's going to mean more expenses and less earnings for those. Now, obviously, those miners are still going to do very well. If the price doubles over the next, uh, you know, over the next two years, miners are going to be where it's at, and you're going to make a lot of money in either that COPX, that copper mine ETF, or the individual miners. But I just want you to understand the risks there that that are also could hit, uh, you know, the miners. Uh, as for myself, uh, I will probably invest a little bit in the miners uh, as well as futures here uh, as we head into next year uh, and that. For a little bit more leverage uh, without heading into the futures market, you can also do some of those long dated calls, right? Uh, those call options on the miners like FCX or S SCCO. Okay, for example, the uh, we can look at the, uh, the FCX here, which is Freeport McMoran. You can look at that again, the world's largest copper miner there, FCX. You go over here to options, you see it's trading at $29 a share now, pre market, or uh, as of Friday, up a little bit in the pre market. But you can go here to options, and uh, you know, most options, so options for the the Global X ETF, the COPX, aren't uh, you know aren't trading much. Uh, the some of the other copper funds, the JJC Copper Fund, uh, doesn't have very good depth for for options. But if you go here to the the individual miners, the larger miners like FCX, like SCCO, you can find some pretty good uh, pretty good margin or options depth. You can go all the way out here to 2025 on the FCX, uh, you know, on the FCX options. I'd probably to probably go to 2024 right now. Maybe leave the 2025s to uh, to next year to buy. But you can buy options here, uh, $29 a share right now. You can buy options here for so uh, the $30 are trading for you know about $6, almost $7 premium. The 25s here, if you want to get a little bit safer, you can buy the 25s for about almost $10 uh, premium. 
you know, that's going to put you right at about $35, uh, you know, cost basis by 2024. But by then we should see a pretty significant jump in the price of copper uh, as well as in the shares of that stock. So just something I wanted to I wanted to talk about, wanted to bring to your attention because again, you know, these this is one of those trends that that you want to be watching, one of the trends that is going to develop over the next few years and quite a bit quicker than a lot of the other longer term universal trends that we're looking at. Uh, again, we are looking at a supply deficit in copper by 2024, 2025 at the latest, and and it's going to grow from there. And there's nothing we can do to stop it. Uh, okay, if we if we want to if we want to go off, uh, you know, the, those fossil fuels, start the electric electrification and things like that, as well as infrastructure projects and, and all that. We're going to need more copper and, uh, and we're going to be in a supply deficit. 